For eight years, Republicans said, we just need power, and then we can do these things. A lot of my town halls, a lot of my listening sessions, a lot of my interaction with constituents, I get the frustration. The speaker says that he is retiring from Congress in January. This news was not entirely unexpected. The deal announced today here at the White House requires Wisconsin lawmakers to pass $3 billion in incentives. Good talk to you, Theo. Do you plan to run for re-election? We're done talking to you, Theo. Goodbye. Do you plan to run for re-election? I'll let you know when I have the answer. I am getting texts and tweets from sources all over the country, people I've worked with in the past, who are telling me that they think this is going to come down to Wisconsin tonight. Protests turned violent. Tear gas was used against the demonstrators. This story has been a long time in the making. In fact, it goes back to last May, the first time I reported on then-Sheriff David Clark's whereabouts. His calendar showed he wasn't often doing work in Milwaukee County but he only handed over one seventh of the records I was asking for and avoided questions about it. So I told him and you I'd keep at it. After the sheriff resigned from office last year and interim sheriff Richard Schmidt took over, guess what landed on my desk? The records I'd been waiting more than a year to get. They span 19 months from January 2015 through July 2016. Over that period, Clark was a frequent flyer. He traveled to 26 states, the District of Columbia, and two foreign countries. New York and California were his favorite destinations. He went to each state eight times. According to the calendars, the average 31-day month, including weekends, went like this. Clark would be out of state for 11 days. He would have an event in another Wisconsin county on one day. 12 days were redacted, so we don't know what the sheriff did. That would leave seven days on an average month when the calendar show Clark did business in Milwaukee County. David Clark was AWOL. Scott Ross is with the liberal group One Wisconsin Now. It was an abuse of taxpayers, it was abuse of Milwaukee County, and it was abuse of the trust that voters had put in him to actually do his job. It's worth noting that receipts show taxpayers paid for just five of the 56 out-of-state trips that Clark took over the 19-month period. For those five trips, he attended policing conferences and meetings at a total cost of $15,300 for airfare, hotels, transportation, and meals. Outside groups picked up the tab for dozens of other trips that often included a speaking engagement. Clark made $94,000 in speaking fees and gifts over this 19-month period, in addition to his $132,000 a year salary as sheriff. Uncle Sam is going to be the dad. When Clark was in Milwaukee, he was often booked for interviews with out-of-state media outlets. And then there's April 30th, 2015. Clark blocked off an hour that morning so two people from the Conservative Political Action Conference and NRA could deliver the $350 muzzle loader rifle the sheriff got for a speech in Maryland that year. In late 2015, Clark took a 16-day trip with the NRA to Israel and Russia. His calendars from that time are heavily redacted and don't explain who he met with. We asked for all of this back in October 2016, when Clark was a national figure in the middle of a presidential campaign. By the time he left office 11 months later, Clark had given us just 90 of the 640 days of calendars we'd requested. Acting Sheriff Richard Schmidt has provided nearly 500 days of Clark's calendars since he took over in September, more than five times what Clark gave us. Clark doesn't work here anymore, but we still don't have all of his travel records. The sheriff's office says it doesn't have August and September 2016, the final two months we asked for. In an email, Deputy Michael Murphy said that when Clark resigned, the ex-sheriff closed access to his Google calendar. In response to our records request, the sheriff's office and the county's top lawyer asked Clark to turn over the missing months by February 22nd. They say Clark has not responded to them. None of it sits well with Scott Ross. David Clark's conduct was outrageous, and David Clark should have to compensate the taxpayers of Milwaukee for not doing his job when they were paying him. Clark has parted ways with his political advisor, Craig Peterson, who tells me the former sheriff is now living near Washington, D.C. We invited Clark to do an interview for this story, but he has not responded. As a woman, I would have definitely supported her. Carolyn Demetropoulos says she would have voted for Sharice Daniels, the Democrat running for an assembly seat representing Watertown, but not anymore. But that's, that's, not, not, your... that's not my signature. 
not even close. Demetropolis is one of 15 people who have signed affidavits saying Daniels faked their names on her nomination papers. Others, like Rudy Voigt, did not sign affidavits but say they never signed Daniels papers either. That's the lowest degree you can get. That's not a person that should be representing anybody. Daniels signed off on each of the papers in question right above the fine print that says falsification is against the law. Watertown police are investigating the fraud allegations. Wisconsin Republicans also filed a complaint with the State Elections Commission. I felt devastated. Daniels was profiled on CNN last year as part of a group of Democratic women who were training to run for office because of the 2016 election. She's challenging Republican Assemblyman John Jagler. Jagler says he knew something was wrong when he saw the name of one of his supporters on Daniels' papers. And he said, that's not my signature. Okay, all right, here we go. One of the addresses is this empty lot in Watertown. I don't know where the, where, where the elector is. I, I'd like to talk to him. Daniels didn't return a phone call or email. Hello? When I stopped at her home, I was told she was at work. Emerge Wisconsin was the group that trained Daniels to run. Emerge did not return a request for comment today. The Wisconsin Elections Commission is scheduled to decide whether to allow Daniels to remain on the ballot or to remove her name at its meeting next Monday. Chief, why won't you ask the mo answer the most basic questions about this incident? Chief Alfonso Morales heads into a closed door meeting at City Hall with state lawmakers from Milwaukee. Lawmakers say they tell Morales to finally take questions about the Sterling Brown incident and later he briefly does. The chief says he's legally barred from naming the officers involved, what discipline they got, or what rules they broke. They could appeal their suspensions. I'm going to be transparent, and I'm trying to be transparent, but I also have to do things within the legal boundaries that I have. Morales says the three cops will absolutely be retrained, but two Democrats say that's not enough, especially for the first officer who confronted Brown outside of Walgreens at 26th and National in January. If that's representative of the force, then we need to do a, a, a clearing house of all bad cops. But it's clear that guy's not a good cop. He should go. Asked why the body camera video wasn't made public for four months, the city's new fire and police commission director says it couldn't have been done any sooner. Cannot be released pending pending an investigation, and there was one pending up until uh, a few days ago. Some lawmakers say people less famous than an NBA player should be getting this level of attention too. I want it for the person yeah. who, when they're standing there and they look like Uncle Boo Boo, I want you to do it for Boo Boo. Chief Morales said he anticipated the national attention this video is now getting. As one state lawmaker put it today, the nation's eyes are on Milwaukee and how we respond to this. And I was very attracted to it. was a warm and fuzzy start to John Dargle's time as Milwaukee County's Parks Director in 2013. Now we've got more another great leader in town. The good vibes didn't last. Four years later, Dargle resigned in this two-sentence letter to County Executive Chris Abley, and that wasn't the end of it. That would have been one of the pre-claimed settlements that I was referring to. Last week, during a county board committee meeting, Abley's HR director revealed that taxpayers had paid Dargle more than $36,000 in December as part of a so-called pre-claim settlement. Then came this report from the county's top lawyer, showing Dargle was paid to resolve a potential discrimination lawsuit. The county's lawyer listed three similar settlements and wrote, quote, there are certainly more of these agreements. I'm finding new categories of payments that I've never heard of before. County Board Chairman Theo Lipscomb pointed to the five-month gap between Dargle's resignation and the $36,000 payment coming to light. Why? Why even a dollar? Um, and, and under whose authority. I think the public deserves answers. Abley was not made available for an interview. His chief of staff said in a statement, quote, the payment was made as part of a settlement agreement between John and the county. We've been open and responsive about any requests we've received for information related to this situation. Some other revelations from the county's top lawyer who says there is no limit to County Executive Abley's ability to use these settlements as long as they're less than $100,000. Importantly, she said the settlements are public records, and so we have made a records request to see more of them. Long before Foxconn came calling, it once was Governor Scott Walker's biggest jobs announcement, a deal to build airplanes here in Wisconsin. How it fell apart, though, is a cautionary tale about future incentive packages. Our political reporter, Theo Keith, has been following Kestrel Aircraft's story for years. Here's his investigation on where the money went. 
This is a story of a big jobs deal. 600 jobs is the biggest package we've had of, of pure outright jobs out there. And what went wrong? There is not a deal to make airplanes. A story of broken promises. I got crushed because I naively believed people. That left taxpayers on the hook. This is not a gift. Nearly six years later, it could end in court. We didn't see it coming. It's a story of clipped wings. This is a story of a project that didn't work out. Superior is as far from Foxconn's Racine County site you can go and still be in Wisconsin, but they know about economic development deals too. In January 2012, Governor Scott Walker came here for the largest jobs announcement this area had seen since World War II. Wisconsin was in the airplane business. Kestrel Aircraft had left Maine to build a new six-seat plane in Superior, where unemployment was 8%. They're looking to grow, and we think there's a good prospect they can grow in the future. The plant was meant for the Douglas County Fairgrounds. My kids showed cattle here. Mark Liebert, a farmer who's now county board chairman, called the whole thing a dream. We were feeling like um, finally the state um, and us were together on a project. and We were hopeful that it would uh, work out for everybody. Nearly six years after the governor's ceremony, there is no plant here, no 600 jobs. In fact, the fair still uses this property every summer. To do the deal, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, WEDC, offered $22 million in tax credits and loans. Local governments kicked in nearly $3 million, plus land at the fairgrounds and another site. The biggest bet came from the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority, WIDA, pledging up to $90 million in federal tax credits. Hundreds of pages of documents show it fell apart within weeks. Kestrel now has 25 Wisconsin workers, not 600. It hasn't made a payment on the state loans in nearly a year and owes $648,000. The city of Superior is making $300,000 a year payments on the loan it gave to Kestrel. There is a reasonable limit. Jim Payne is the mayor. I think it's fair to say that when you borrow money, you should pay it back. Uh, and, and I think none of the banks in town have any problem saying that to any of the homeowners in town. There were other effects, too. The local technical college closed a program that trained people to work on the plane. Dave Crockett was one of the instructors. I feel it was a loss. It was a loss to the state. I think it was a loss to the school for what it could have been here. At Kestrel's headquarters in the old post office building downtown, CEO Alan Klapmeyer explained his side to me. This is a story of integrity. Klapmeyer puts the blame squarely on the state. He says Wisconsin failed to deliver some of the promised cash on time and didn't come through with other allotments at all. The state did not do what it said it would do in the beginning and then blamed us for them not doing what they said they were going to do first. And so for that, I suppose I would broadly put the blame on the governor, on WDC, on WIDA. Signed contracts do reference what Klapmeyer says he was promised. This one says Kestrel shall have received the rights to the money. But WIDA officials say they only promised to help the company pursue it. Some at the agency had doubts early on. In 2012, one warned there was no real way to guarantee an aircraft plant would be realized. The WIDA board chairman called the deal very risky and speculative. Klapmeyer says he needed the total package to move the project forward. And the $16 million that Kestrel did get wasn't enough. Where's the money? Uh, well, by where's the money, I assume what you mean technically is how was the money spent. And the money was spent primarily on salaries of engineers. So it was funding the company to do what we said we would do. Kestrel first missed payments in late 2013. But as it turns out, Wisconsin wasn't done offering money. In April 2014, WEDC wrote a $10,000 grant so Klapmeyer could attend an air trade show in China. He backed away from the offer. Did you ask for the money? No. They, so, they were willing to give it yeah. to you? Um, and you? And you were the one who cut it short. Exactly. Nearly six years in, Klapmeyer says he has new hope the Kestrel will take flight. His company is redesigning a different plane that's in production, expecting to shift sales revenue into the Kestrel. Klapmeyer has a small parts facility, and there we saw the Kestrel, at least a mock-up version of it, without wings. But none of that is happening in Superior, not even in Wisconsin. In fact, it's happening an hour and a half across the border in Minnesota. Klapmeyer, who sought state assistance in Maine and then Wisconsin, got a $1.5 million loan from a northern Minnesota board last year. He hasn't touched the loan, 
So would he move Kestrel to Minnesota? The thought certainly crosses my mind. This month, WEDC started legal action against Kestrel, but has not gone to court. WEDC declined a comprehensive interview, and its CEO was vague when I asked about his plans. So we'll continue to pursue whatever rights we have to protect the investment that we made. Klapmeyer acknowledges Wisconsin could put him out of business by pursuing the loans in court and says he bet his future on the plane. Will it work? I hope so, because it's, it's my life that's the, on the line here, not the state's. If it doesn't, will the taxpayers get all their money back? Certainly not. It was a big bet for Wisconsin, and especially for Superior, and it leaves people like Mark Liebert unsure if they do it again. This is a story of a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This really was the, our chance. There's a footnote to this story because Alan Klapmeyer has since laid off some of his 25 remaining employees in Superior. When we talked again last week, he wouldn't say how many, but called it a cut, not a closing. As for WEDC's threat of legal action, Klapmeyer says he's disappointed that came out in the media. He says there's no upside to the state taking him to court because Kestrel has lenders and the state wouldn't get anything. House Speaker Paul Ryan usually gets friendly questions at business tours, like the one he did at Banker Wire in McGuanago, which makes mesh products. But Wednesday, the man who runs the welding division here challenged him. I think for eight horrible years, I heard we don't have control of the House, we don't have control of the Senate, we don't have the presidency. Well, I'll tell you what, you're in there now, yep. and all I see is infighting. It's very dysfunctional. In his answer, Ryan pointed out bills the House has passed. Afterward, I asked him about it. Do you get that a lot? And, the, and, and for eight years, Republicans said, we just need power, and then we can do these. Things. A lot of my town halls, a lot of my listening sessions, a lot of my interactions with constituents, I get the frustration. The speaker says he's frustrated, too, after the Republican health care bill failed in the Senate. I'll be blunt and say that the House is a little frustrated because the House passed its Obamacare replacement legislation last May. So we kept our promise and passed our bill last May. We're hopeful that the Senate keeps going at this. The Senate can bring this back up and re-vote if they want to. But Ryan is moving on to an issue he's wanted to tackle for years, changing the tax code. Madison Democrat Mark Pocan said he didn't see that happening either. Uh, what's your response to him? Well, I, I, he's wrong about that. Uh, I think tax reform is probably the biggest achievement we'll get this year. And it's one of the things that we are all invested in.